So, uh, Professor Kenamori and I have both been at Caltech for many years, and I just have to comment when he says five seconds is a long time. This is coming from Professor Kenamori. So, all of us as scientists uh, struggle writing our papers, and it usually takes us months of of, of struggle. And Professor Kenamori would come in uh, Monday morning, and he said. This paper was so hard, it took me all weekend to write it, and we all got very depressed. Uh, <laughs> so he, he works on a very, very rapid time scale. So, um, so I want to describe where we currently are in California, and most of these slides are actually uh, prepared by uh, Al Hauksen and uh, Maren Boza. Uh, and uh, actually, there's a, this is the summary of a work of quite a few people that have been uh, working uh, on early warning for some period of time. We go to our scientific meetings and present the results, but we're very excited because just recently uh, the system is actually uh, sending some of us some sorts of uh, alerts in in uh, in real time. This is this is a collaboration between. Um, this comes out of the California Integrated Seismic Network uh, is the uh, underlying basis of this. There's uh, uh, a variety of different institutions that collaborate together to run the seismographic networks in California. The California Geological Survey, the USGS uh, has uh, offices in both the Bay Area and uh, in Southern California. Cal -EAM is involved, Caltech and UC Berkeley all collaborate to operate uh, the the bulk of the seismic recordings in uh, California. Uh, in addition, there are all these uh, people, uh, uh, some of them uh, are here at Berkeley, uh, some are at Caltech. Uh, one of uh, the groups is actually at uh, ETH in Switzerland, one of my uh, former students, uh, George Akua. We, uh, we have a, a, a multi-year project. Can we go to the next one? So we have a, a multi-year project uh, to do uh, and test uh, early warning system algorithms uh, in California. And the idea is to uh, develop those algorithms, identify needed improvements in the system, and actually implement an end-to-end -end prototype test system. Uh, in order to do early warning, you've got to have uh, rapid earthquake detection, uh, early magnitude estimation, got to be able to predict uh, how strong the ground shaking is going to be at some different place. Uh, robust seismic networks, this is a big one. Um, and we've been working on that for years. And well-trained, uh, I think you want users, uh, uh, users in uh, the system. And a lot of things have to be uh, automated in here. And probably this one, we haven't made uh, much progress on. Uh, up to this point in time. Uh, some of these others, actually, we've, we've made a fair amount of progress. Next slide. So, uh, so at the moment, there are three main uh, uh, algorithms that have been developed through the years. Uh, as was uh, pointed out, there are on-site types of algorithms, and uh, the main on-site type algorithm is something we call Tau CPD, and I won't explain to you what those actually mean, but that was uh, developed uh, primarily at Caltech. Uh, Hiro Kanamori uh, uh, was uh, very instrumental in uh, developing that algorithm. There's uh, a second algorithm called the virtual seismologist, uh, largely developed uh, on the, as the group that I've got at Caltech, uh, and that's uh, an expert uh, system type of, uh, of uh, system. Another expert system that's sort of in between the Caltech uh, on-site and the virtual seismologist is the ELARM system uh, that's been uh, developed here at UC Berkeley, uh, primarily under the leadership of, uh, of Richard Allen here. Um, so those have been, we've been testing them for uh, and developing them for a number of years, probably at least half a dozen years, more than that. And, uh, and then, um, uh, more recently, we've turned into this uh, a collaborative project where all three groups work together to compare their algorithms and to, to, to bring them together into one uh, stream where we uh, have an alerting system. 
So right now, uh, there's a statewide in implementation, uh, 382 stations uh, total in the state, uh, and with a total of 585 uh, broadband and strong motion instruments. And um, we pick up lots of moderate earthquakes and uh, some smaller ones. We just had uh, this magnitude 7.2 earthquake uh, south of the border, and uh, it's a very interesting earthquake for uh, early warning because it's outside of our network and a very complicated sequence. And uh, th we had some success with this, but it also made us realize how challenging this problem can be in some instances. In addition, there's uh, a testing center that's uh, at USC. It's part of the Southern California Earthquake Center. The Southern California Earthquake Center uh, runs a testing facility for earthquake predictability. Uh, it, it looks at uh, uh, the issue of people make uh, estimates of if the hazard is changing as a function of time. In essence, uh, early warning is the ultimate in uh, uh, earthquake prediction problems. I mean, <laughs> the earthquake started and you want to know what, what's going to happen next. Uh, in some ways, it's easier than any other kind of earthquake prediction, but, but really, you need to have some way for us to make a statement and then test and see whether what we said is about to happen really does happen. So, so uh, the Southern California Earthquake Center is uh, helping document uh, the performance of the system. Next slide. Um, this, uh, this, we're in the middle of a three-year uh, project that's been funded by the U.S. Geological Survey to do this prototype uh, early warning system. The first uh, year of the project is uh, it's, uh, it's gone, and we've, we've done all those tasks that we said we'd do. We wrote down what the specifications were that we needed to make an operational system, or a prototype system, excuse me. Uh, we uh, 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 designed computer codes, defined the formats and protocols for those to talk to each other, and did the implementation of uh, what we call end-to-end -end processing. In other words, it works. Uh, 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 test with archived data. Actually, this one looks like it's already done. We've set up the mechanism to test archived data, but that's actually a very important step for us. We want to run through all the historic data in our uh, databases and uh, test our algorithm, test the system to make sure it works. Uh, testing with real-time data, we've just begun that about uh, five weeks ago, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, and uh, we want to improve the, the performance of the system where everybody's working hard now that it's actually working because uh, people who can see it, if there's something going wrong, uh, I think Mark said, we're all in a little bit, we're all very competitive people and everybody wants their system to, to do very well. So, um, testing with selected users, we're just beginning to talk about that and hopefully some of you in, out there are interested in this issue. Uh, next year, we're, uh, we're promising to continue uh, operating uh, the prototype sy uh, system uh, and add additional features to it. Uh, a very important issue in here is uh, how to add in uh, global positioning satellite data. Most of what we're working on is based on inertial seismometers, the acceleration of the ground, but we feel in bigger quakes, uh, global positioning satellite will have a, a very important role in this problem, and we're sort of uh, just getting started in this part of the problem. Uh, research on finite sources, I'll sh Hiro mentioned uh, about uh, what happened, uh, that Tokyo didn't get a warning, and it's an equally important problem in California, and I'll show you that in a second, and uh, plans for future systems. Next slide. Well, this is a, I won't go through this in a lot of detail, but these are the, it's a histogram of the delay between the time a ground motion is recorded at some place and when it actually shows up at our processing center. And there are different networks in here. Uh, there's the, the Berkeley Network and uh, Northern California Strong Motion Network and uh, National uh, 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 Strong Motion Network. And you'll see that some of these uh, systems 
had fairly large delays between the time when the ground motion occurred and when it showed up at the central processing site. And this was a big impediment to us. Great uh, seismic system, but 10 seconds of delay. You don't want 10 seconds of delay in the system. So we've worked hard, next slide, uh, to uh, reduce those delays. And uh, so all the stations in Southern California have been, uh, well, not all yet, but they're all planned to be upgraded. Uh, Al, do you know how many we've actually upgraded? Well, it's almost done then. This was. Uh, in I'm sorry. There's also upgrades in Northern California. So uh, there's this was done with uh, ARRA uh, uh, funding, and uh, it's really uh, going to allow us to have uh, uh, be closer to having a, a, a working system. We've been uh, uh, working on increased station density, although uh, I think uh, we still recognize to have an effective system. We really need to work on that. Um, and we've been uh, working on uh, 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 how many stations are necessary for the uh, network stations to declare in an event. In essence, remember, there's, uh, you can have an on-site uh, warning system that works on just one station, the current uh, systems that are network-based require uh, four or five stations to trigger before we send in information. And as we go to, to the future, there'll probably be more of a hybrid where the network approaches will require as few as two stations, so they'll be faster. Next slide. Well, uh, we've had a, a several earthquakes to uh, uh, practice on. None of these earthquakes happened while the systems were running in real time like they are now. But we ran the systems with a delay in them, uh, and uh, it, the delay was uh, uh, recognized that if we, when we went real time, we could uh, remove the delay. If you looked at that, uh, how it was working for things like the 5.4 Alum Rock earthquake, Chino Hills, or Baja, uh, it certainly, the algorithms look like they would have worked for all of these events, although, like I say, this Baja event is, uh, is one that will keep us uh, uh, developing the system for a long time, but primarily because it's got some foreshock just uh, 10 seconds before the big part of the, the earthquake, so that's a, that's a tricky one. And largely, the system has been uh, working reliably. Next slide. So uh, the way things currently stand, uh, we've got the three systems, and the systems feed information into a, a newly created piece that we call the decision module. And basically, it takes all this information from these algorithms and outputs out of it a stream updated uh, basically every second of what's the most probable magnitude, location, origin time, and uh, and then uh, and here very important to us is the uncertainties in this problem. So, with any kind of expert system that's working in real time, there's uh, an answer, but there's always uncertainty in this problem. And uh, trying to follow those uncertainties through to decision making is an important aspect of the problem. So we're including things like probability that it's a, a false uh, trigger. So. If you're only triggering on one station, maybe it's a cow or something. Kick the. But if you're right next to where it triggered, uh, you may not have much time to take a, an, a to use the alert. And for some applications, people might want to just do something with just one station. Uh, so we want some indication of what's the probability. We'd say, well, if you just got one station, maybe it's. 80% chance it's not even an earthquake, but if it doesn't cost anything to do something, maybe somebody would want to do, do something with it. It really depends on the application. And uh, <coughs> so if two stations came in and they're next to each other, it's probably an earthquake. So we, we're sending out that kind of updated uh, information, uh, and we're working on how to send out a, a cancel message if, if needed. Uh, 
I joked that we wanted to have Gilda Radner's voice on saying, never mind. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next slide, please. So um, this decision module then sends the information out uh, uh, very quickly to uh, a user module which uh, uh, actually does the uh, early warning. The user module knows where it is and, uh, and uh, makes the actual predicted ground motion and uh, counts down w uh, when it will actually occur. And in addition, the information is, uh, uh, will go off to the SCEC, uh, Southern California Earthquake Center Testing Center. Next slide. Uh-oh, that's a little hard to read. I'm sorry about that. Well, here's the three systems. Goes into the uh, decision module, and now there's a new module that's called the user display. And this is a, uh, a Java-based pop-up window that uh, will pop up and show you where the earthquake is, where you are, and start to shout, uh, count down. Next slide. So, for instance, um, if... Uh, Here's what it looks like for us. We're in Pasadena where this house is. The thing pops up on uh, the computer. It shows where the epicenter is, shows the P wave uh, progressing out in a movie, the S wave progressing out, starts to count down and uh, makes an obnoxious noise. Uh, in fact, I started it up on my computer at home and uh, it was out in the front uh, going away and my wife said, what's wrong with a washing machine? <laughs> and I told her it was our new exciting uh, alert system. Next slide, please. Let's see. So uh, it tells you uh, the expected intensity based on how far away you are and uh, the uh, size of the earthquake, expected magnitude, and then uh, time. Uh, next slide. Next, let's see, and uh, well, I just explained those two. Next, location of PNS waveforms, uh, yellow and red. Uh, next, oh, and then it these uh, these different rings are the uh, just a map of the expected intensity of the shaking uh, in here, so you get a really quick idea of what's going on. Next slide. And this uh, siren goes on, and uh, there's a voice announcement. Uh, it, uh, it counts down and says, uh, weak shaking. I've got it set in my house, so it goes off for everything. So, <laughs> so it comes on pretty often, and it, it uh, comes on, and it says, no shaking in seven seconds. <laughs> Next slide, but that's all adjustable. And let me show you what it might look like if we, uh, if we actually get, get something like the Northridge earthquake is experienced in Pasadena. And get by all oh, my security here. That's almost enough time for Hero to write a paper. So. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's, uh, we recognize there's some real challenges here. The, the biggest uh, promise of earthquake warning is that once in a lifetime, a great earthquake that ruptures a very large section of a fault uh, where the epicenter may be a large distance from you but you may be strongly shaken because you're close to the fault, but, but, uh, but the system in that case will uh, have to deal with that finite, finiteness. So, um, so this would be uh, what we call a shakeout case, an earthquake that starts on the San Andreas system, and in 
in this case, the earthquake would propagate up the fault, but the system would only recognize where the epicenter is and say, here's the epicenter. We know it's a big earthquake, but based on the distance from the epicenter, you don't expect any strong shaking in Los Angeles. You'd have plenty of time to react to the system. See, it's still counting down for you, but it'd be telling you no problem in Los Angeles. And in the meantime, the rupture would be running up the fault at you, and you'd really want to know that. So how do we teach the system to deal with this kind of case and be flexible enough that it could deal with it in many cases? Maybe let's uh, close this guy up. So, okay, maybe just next slide. So, so we're, we're working on ways uh, to deal with that. And for instance, we've got uh, written an algorithm that's just about to be implemented that uh, looks at the different aspects of the ground shaking and decides whether a station is close to a rupture or not. So we call it a near source discriminant. If it's close to a rupture, it basically turns the stations red. And uh, by characterizing which stations turn red at which times, the idea is then to be able to keep a track of what the earthquake is at any given time and know if it's getting closer to you. So next line. So in, in that case, if you wanted to predict the shaking here, instead of using this distance from the epicenter, you'd use the closest distance from the fault rupture and you'd predict much stronger shaking. Next line. So this would be sort of the near source area uh, recognized by these uh, uh, special stations that have picked up near source ground shaking. Next line. So if you look, thought about how it might evolve with time, when the earthquake first starts, only a few stations would be near source. And as it progresses, then uh, you uh, have the system update that the length of the, state, uh, the uh, shaking is longer. This is in the future, but we have, I think, viable strategies to deal with this. Next. Um, so in addition to our running the algorithms, a number of us are still trying to do the logic of how an early warning system really works. Uh, uh, development of algorithms, uh, especially to analyze long ruptures. And uh, I'm working on that, Marin Buzz, uh, one of my students at Caltech, uh, uh, Richard uh, uh, and his student are working on uh, those algorithms. Um, we're act also working on, uh, once you have this information about what uh, is going on, how do you turn it into a decision of uh, uh, when to take an action. And so that's actually not a trivial thing. It's uh, uh, we're sending out information and if it's an industry, everybody has different cost benefits, times it would take for them to take an action, and when's the right time to take an action. It's clear that one size will not fit all. So uh, we're working on uh, with the information science people about developing expert systems uh, that will be modified so that they are appropriate for the, uh, um, the cost benefit of different kinds of uh, decisions by different uh, groups. Uh, and uh, we're also working on trying to come up with something we call a, a slip detector working on a GPS. So, it, you know, with GPS you can tell positions of things. If you have GPS sensors on opposite sides of the San Andreas Fault, and suddenly they uh, move uh, relative to each other by five meters and the motion's parallel to the San Andreas Fault, well, you know what's happened. The San Andreas just slipped. So we're trying to work on that. Next slide. So uh, just in conclusion, we've got a lot of the elements and we put them together uh, to, uh, to produce a, sort of a, a first prototype uh, real-time alerting system. But I think we all recognize that a tremendous amount of work remains to be done to actually come up with a reliable system for, for general use. It's, it's in my house. My, my wife uh, is starting to get a little tired of the fact that I've got it set for zero magnitude. And, um, but to turn it loose 
to the rest of, uh, of uh, California and the Pacific Northwest. We've still got a lot of work to do, so thank you. Any idea on uh, the timeline for getting this uh, available for general use? Question is the timeline on availability for general use. And this is a big, long discussion lately. Uh, you know, when, when should we, uh, when are we ready to do this? And, uh, well, part of the, part of the answer is that, uh, I work for the California Institute of Technology. It's a private university. And Richard is at UC Berkeley. And uh, these are universities, and we do university things. We run these networks together with, with uh, the US Geological Survey. But I can tell you right now that Caltech lawyers get pretty nervous when we talk about uh, Caltech actually releasing this stuff. And, I'll also tell you that the scientists are, we're excited about this. I mean, we want to see this happen, but, uh, but our lawyers are also worried that we get excited. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I think all of us recognize that uh, to really become a reality will require uh, 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 a, a very uh, dedicated buy-in by the government sector to actually uh, run a system, just as we see JMA in uh, in Japan uh, is sort of the core of the system. Many groups are working on early warning, including private industry in Japan, but the core of the system is sponsored by the Japanese government. And in the United States, uh, it's hard to imagine that we could uh, get too far uh, as universities. So uh, the, the development of a real and funded plan for the USGS is probably important for the actual deployment of a system in, uh, in the West Coast. If it wasn't the USGS, I'm not sure who it would be. Uh, if you look in the federal structure, the USGS seems to be the agency that actually has the mandate to do this type of, uh, of work. I could add a comment if, yes. if that's useful uh, for, for USGS Earthquake Hazards Program. Uh, the USGS does have the federal mandate for issuing warnings of, of uh, geologic hazards, including earthquakes, and so it is in our, in our purview to, to, to take the federal responsibility for that. For over a decade now, um, the USGS has uh, been working to f follow essentially uh, the Japanese model of building an advanced seismic system for the nation that uh, has a variety of purposes, and one of the fundamental purposes uh, of that is to enable earthquake early warning. The plan for development of the advanced national seismic system, which was uh, a, a report to Congress, requested by Congress in 1999, identified earthquake early warning as one of the fundamental goals of a, of a fully fleshed out advanced system. Uh, given the, the constraints of, of funding and, and so forth, that system is coming along. Uh, it right now is at a, a, at a stage of build out of about 25% of that envisioned uh, a decade ago. Uh, there was a, a boost to that from the stimulus funding. We invested uh, quite a number of dollars of stimulus funds as was, was discussed in advancing the state of uh, quickness and sophistication of the network to be able to, to provide a, f a foundation for early warning. Frankly, the, the system, in order to be ready for early warning, we need two things. One is we need the kinds of research results that are being developed by the collaboration, development of the methods, the testing, and so forth. We also need a system that uh, has the station density, uh, the station connectivity, and the robustness in order to absolutely guarantee that the system can deliver early warning when needed. We can't turn on an early warning system that might work or is only going to work during weekdays. We need a system that's hardened, fast, sophisticated, reliable, 24 by 7 by 365. 
And so the work that is going on right now is, is laying the foundation. The, the work of the collaboration has now illustrated that there are concrete benefits to the West Coast for early warning. If we have a system, it actually will provide benefits as it, as it has in Japan. Uh, and we now have a good, a, a good outline for what steps are needed in order to prove the network, what research is additionally needed to, to make sure that the, that the system can deal with the variety of earthquakes that may be, uh, may be facing us, and, uh, and then work with the user community uh, as represented here on what sort of information, on what time scale, with what level of certainty and so forth is actually useful for actions to be taken. So right now we're, we're laying the foundation. If we do have the opportunity to, uh, and, and the public mandate to construct an operating public warning system or, or even one that uh, is operating uh, for a selected sector, um, then we are prepared to move forward with that. But it's going to take a significant investment. Yes. approach um, or uh, and the Japanese technological approach so the question is I'm sure uh, that's like a whole an entire day of presentations <laughs> what I just asked so the, the question is that uh, the differences between what we're doing and uh, how JMA does the problem I think there are some uh, real uh, technical similarities uh, many of the techniques that have been uh, developed in Japan are things that we're also pursuing uh, in the United States. In detail, um, uh, though there are some, some fairly big differences, I know in the virtual seismologist system, uh, we are uh, using a different kind of information science basis uh, development of the system. Um, to be just completely frank and honest, though, the Japan Meteorological Agency is, is a, uh, it's, it's a, a very um, well-run uh, and extremely well-disciplined bureaucracy. So, and it's, it's kind of impenetrable to us. So to be, when we ask questions, we get some answers, but not lots of them. It's, I, I imagine it is sort of like talking to a military organization. And, uh, and whereas when you talk to scientists, you can't shut them up. Uh, it, when, <laughs> when you talk to the Japan Meteorological Agency, generally the answers are fairly short. And, uh, <laughs> Tom, if I could just put my user hat on here for a second. You've, you've talked about how you've been successful in providing rapid estimates of magnitude and shaking intensity. Could you say a couple words about where you are in providing estimates of actual ground motion levels, you know, accelerations and things like that that are of use to the engineering community. To make so, so the question is, uh, can we uh, predict uh, ground shaking levels? Uh, and and uh, I, in terms of uh, the question here is, how well can we predict ground shaking for making decisions? And at the moment, we're uh, primarily predicting acceleration and velocity of the ground and we can combine that together to some sort of in intensity estimate. Uh, to be honest with you, I, part of my uh, dream is that, uh, you know, if you feel an earthquake, it feels completely different whether you're on the ground or whether you're in a high-rise building. And if, you, uh, if you're in a small earthquake in a high-rise building, it actually means nothing to a high-rise building but it might be pretty sharp to you if you were in, on the ground. If you were, uh, on the other hand, if you had this uh, giant earthquake in Japan, in Tokyo, I'm sure on the ground, the ground shaking didn't seem all that strong, but I'm sure the people in the high-rise buildings were pretty excited by this, uh, this ground shaking. So uh, ultimately, you can see that part of uh, the prediction of how, what's the ground shaking or the room shaking going to be like also involves the structure that you're actually in. So, so I mean, it's not just ground shaking. It's we live in and we exist in in buildings. We are our, our, all of our instrumentation is uh, in buildings. So part of this will ultimately be predicting what will happen in a room. So, but it's coming. <laughs>